Happy Sunday, everybody. My name is Scott Medina. Welcome to our YouTube channel where we talk about things that make your life better and make you better at life. Honestly, we're excited about always hanging with you. We always look forward to this time. This is a place where a group of us come along and share Jesus ideas. So hopefully you're excited to be with us today. I got Lily over here to my left today, sipping on her coffee today. Happy Sunday. I almost thought you were going to say happy Easter there. I was like, well, that's no, nope, Easter is gone. Unless you're watching this like I don't know. And it is Easter because it's... 11 months from now. Yeah. It'll be on its way. Yeah, it could be. Uh, but we're excited to to really do something a little bit different today. So if you're in in uh, uh, the live chat today, man, that's the best place, place to be today because you can <laughs> talk, chat, catch up with each other, explain who you are because you've changed your name. So many of you guys are changing your names. I was talking to my mom the other day. I was like, Mom, no one knows who you are now. Yeah. Lily, what were you saying that she looks so inconspicuous? Inconspicuous. Yes. Because you don't have a photo either. So maybe you should just upload a photo. I don't know. Maybe of your cat. Oh, uh, no, because that's, that's but not. But then we would, in, then we time, would know. in time, we would uh, know that it's, it's you. you. And the okay. same is true. If you don't. Yeah, we're all learning who's who. Uh, but it's uh, a thing right now uh, here at Unlock Church on YouTube to be changing your icon in your name uh, I think uh, I think it's a great thing and I, I'm like we got first time guests and like no that is formally known as thank yeah. you Nick <laughs> for keeping your name in your new name so at least I know that formerly known as Nick has uh, been a a whirlwind of new names popping in been trying to get Nick to come up and clown with Megan been yes. DMing all week great. trying to convince That's good him to hear. he's like he said how about next year Lil why because he's like this is a little bit late notice I was like you know nah, this is in, in June well in, it's Two months from now. That's that's we're we're ahead of the schedule. We're excited about. Okay, uh, <laughs> hopefully hopefully we can come to an agreement. I feel like I'm in some kind of negotiation, like with football players. Like, no, how do we sweeten the deal nice. to get them here? Because it'd be really yeah. sweet yeah, to work on your phobia. Yeah. Work on your phobia. Oh, of clowns. Yeah. Of clowns. <laughs> At first, I was like, what phobia? Now, could you like? I don't really have phobias. I, I was thinking fears. about this uh, during this week. If we dressed you up as a clown, would it help with your phobia? I, it would be hilarious, and I think we should do that. But would you would you be afraid of yourself? We should do a whole segment on stage where Megan and Nick dress me up as a clown. But would, do you think you would be? You look in the mirror, you go ah, or you'd be like, no, this is helping me. It would help. It would help, she says. Yeah, okay. that would be hilarious. Yeah, we might make this happen at, at camp. Stay tuned as we're in strict I negotiation. I also just have a feeling we should bring in some like fish somehow for like, Joey. Big fish. For Joey? Um, like real fish? Yeah, to like throw around, maybe like catch the fish. I don't think that's appropriate. That'd be hilarious. Like, I think it's hilarious. With the leaders. Somebody, somebody would turn us in. Somebody would say that's harmful. The fish will already be dead. <laughs> yeah. I'm all for it. But somebody's already writing an email to us saying you can't do that no, because... No, I just have a vision. Oh boy, It'll be okay, hilarious. let's make it happen. Swedish fish. We'll use Swedish fish. <laughs> no, okay, today we got something fish. really special for you guys. It's very unique. Currently, what you're experiencing at this moment, what's so unique about this? Is it live? Okay. Not technically, but we just love you guys so much that we wanted to spend a little extra time preparing for you. And also, currently, we get to be at a place that you're going to hear about from Scott right now. Yeah, we are in Austin, Texas. I'm supporting our racing jersey because a bunch of us will have just finished racing at Dirt Surfers at Lemonade Float Fest just outside of Austin, Texas. So who knows what will be uh, or who will be wearing hardware or not. Uh, at this point, we will have known. So hopefully you're following us on Instagram. And then secondly, uh, I have an opportunity to be able to thank uh, a, a church down there in Austin. High Park is a church that has partnered with us helped us get this studio where we I mean let's just get the wide shot so you yeah. get the whole magnitude of this thing they helped us build it they helped us build it they got it here for us to get out of the garage so we're down there saying thank you on your behalf in Unlock Church's behalf saying thank you to all of the contributors that came and helped build it but also gave resources we're thanking them on your behalf so uh, we're excited to be down there. I had a chance a few years ago to be down there, and when I was down there, uh, I, I rode a one wheel into the auditorium, and we're going to play that teaching with you here today. So you're, it's going to be very different. So if you're first time guests come back, it's much more of this podcast style, talking and getting to interject. This is going to be a teaching that was filmed on location there. I ride in on a one wheel. 
it'll be almost like you're there with us because physically while you watch this we'll be at this church we, that's correct yeah so it'll be exciting um to to give you a taste of where we're at you're gonna sense the the uh accent because we're down in texas folks as they <laughs> introduce me and then we're gonna be right back at the end so don't leave we'll come right back up to wrap it up after i end the teaching in prayer in high park okay so enjoy this we'll be right back we have a special guest today as you're being seated. His name is Scott Mendenhall, and he is with Unlock Church, a church that we partner with. And I want you to give a warm, boisterous Hyde Park welcome to Scott. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Welcome this morning. My name is Scott Mendenhall. And I am really glad to be here. Your first time guest, this is not a normal entrance, okay? This is, just, this is just me, just doing my thing, all right? I like to float around. It makes me feel more angelic and things like that. So we're just going to do this all day like that, okay? Is everyone all right with that? You can track with me. I'll just come down the aisle a little bit. Just make sure if somebody's not behaving correctly, I'll come down and point a finger at you. I'll be like, now come on. Now listen, okay, that's why they, got, they told me I shouldn't do that because the lighting would be bad, but I thought it would just hide my imperfections if I went where it's dark. Anyways, I'm so glad to be here. We're going to talk about this. It's a one wheel, and it has nothing to do with Jesus, but it has something to do with spreading the gospel, okay? So stay, just rest assured we'll get to that if I remember, okay? Um, if I remember, this is correct. If you are a first-time guest, Stop searching for a church. You found home. Stay here. Amazing people here. How do I know that? Because I've had heaps of people come to the tundra of Minnesota on mission trips, and we love every one of you that have been on mission trips to, to the tundra. Man, you guys have a special spot in our hearts. Um, the, the people that are praying for us, those that are giving resources, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thanks isn't enough. Uh, just know that we are continuing to spread the message of Jesus as best we can. I think that's the best way to say thank you. And so thank you for everybody. It's an honor to be here. It's a privilege. Uh, and so my hope is today that we say something that would inspire you to take a step in your relationship with Jesus. And I know in a size crowd like this, those that are up top, those that are down here, and those that are watching online, uh, I, it's, what I love about Jesus is that he can speak right to you and it will be unique to you. It's not going to be what he's saying to somebody next to you. And so answer this question throughout this next few minutes is what is Jesus saying to you? What are you going to do about it? What is Jesus saying to you? What are you going to do about it? He brought you here today and got me from the tundra of Minnesota today to come and, and say something that is God inspired. These are not my words. The stories I will share today are just Jesus stories where Jesus is showing up and showing off and he's still performing miracles. And I'm going to be really crazy and excited about it because I'm passionate about it because Jesus is still doing some crazy things. And I'm excited about the next generation that will get the church that, that we are building in, in the tundra of Minnesota. I'm I'm excited. And so I want you to get excited with me. If you don't, I'll call you out, okay? So um, there you go. You're laughing a little bit. We'll get you warmed up. Uh, we will serve Red Bull partway through just to keep the energy levels up. Um, I have not had one ounce of Red Bull. I am married to a wonderful woman named Holly Mendenhall. She is, and I have been married 18 years. We have, grew up together. Like our story is like kind of sick, okay? We knew each other since fifth grade. She didn't date anyone but me. I was the first person to kiss her. You know how nervous I was? She was 22 years old and I, and I kissed her and I was like, oh my goodness. I, know, I, bet, I better one, know that I, I'm going to marry her because I can't take that from her. And two, I was like, she's never been kissed. She's had 22 years to play this out in her life. I got to make it so memorable. And um, eight kids later, you better believe it's memorable. <laughs> Um, here's the deal. I don't know what causes children, nor does Holly. Okay, we have no idea. So all of you go, do you, eight kids, like, well, you know that's a lot. We don't know what, I just, we don't know how that happens, okay? So feel free to share in the lobby afterwards how you think it happens. We tried a lot of things, like we stopped shaking hands, uh, that, that was, she still got pregnant. I stopped taking my shirt off when I ran outdoors, and it, that still didn't uh, happen. It just... Something causes, I don't know if it's in the water, I just, I don't know. We, no, and some of you are going to go, well, do you have a TV in the bedroom? We do not. I think there's other things to be done in the bedroom besides watch TV, and maybe that's the problem. <laughs> but whatever causes children, do know this. I think we must be really good whatever causes it, because uh, we have eight of them. So, uh, so you're like, whoa, way too much information. If you laugh, you're going to enjoy today. If you're like uncomfortable, Jesus better speak to you then, I hope. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, Holly will ask, she'll ask like Kathy French, we're really good friends with Kathy French, she'll ask how, it, it, it's got to do the eight kid joke thing and not know what it calls it, because she always says, don't do that, don't do that, but it's, it's like there's something about me that's like, they laugh at it every time, and when they stop laughing at it, I won't do it. Um, so um, thank you for laughing, it gives me permission to myself next time to do it again. Uh, I just have to, I have other ways to explain why we have eight kids, so if I get invited back, then we'll share those. Um, but uh, my, my, honestly, my, my real hope and desire is to tell Jesus stories, real life, eyewitness accounts of Jesus stories that happened this past week in the tundra of Minnesota. Uh, my hope is to tell past Jesus stories that would inspire you to live life on mission, that would inspire you to do life differently, to be intentional in what you do. I mean, I'm looking in, in this auditorium today, up there, down here, and there's empty seats, empty seats, empty pews. What do I say? Pews? Empty pews? Empty pews. Thanks. No one helping me there. Um, um, empty pews. But there's room for people. There's room for people. And it doesn't seem to make, you know, like, you know, like, what breaks my heart is that, like, you're okay with that. That, that you, there's nothing breaking your heart that you have somehow thought this is what it's supposed to be like. Did not Jesus die on a cross and rise again for everyone, the person that drives you bonkers? He died on a cross and rose again for them. He is the hope of the world, the light in the darkness, and yet you seem to think it's all about something else. Here's the problem with churches in general. I've been a pastor for 22 years. Some of you are trying to figure out, based on my look, my image, how old I am, eight kids. He's got to be around here. I told the first service that I would tell my age, and I forgot. Um, that's probably because I have ADD. I jump around a lot on things. Uh, but I don't really know if I have ADD. I took a test once online, and I didn't finish it. And so I'm pretty sure that meant I have ADD. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, but then some of you are going to have to ask yourself, Maybe he actually knows what he's doing and he does these ADD things to just keep you wrangled in a little bit. Maybe it's just to keep you engaged a little bit. It's just a mystery that only we will know when we find Jesus in heaven. Um, and my wife has tried to figure it out for years. But 22 years as, as a pastor, and I, I love people. I love complicated people. I love messy people. I love people that think they have it together that aren't messy. Um, here's the deal. We recognize messes because we know what it looks like in our lives. And doesn't Jesus come along and say, hey, listen, pull out the big chunk of wood out of your eye before you go to the teeny weeny splinter in the other person's? Jesus is saying you only recognize that splinter in their eye because you've got the tree in yours. So when you get aggravated with your coworker because of their poor attitude, you only recognize their poor attitude because you have a poor attitude somewhere else. Deal with your mess before you go address their mess. It isn't actually, you know, it's not even your job to do that. Our job is to point people to Jesus. Jesus saves people and changes people. You don't do either one of those and neither do I. And that is freeing. Whew, I don't save anybody. I'm actually, I'm not the one that's going to change you today. But in Western culture, Jesus thinking, we think it's our job to be the change agent. Like we come in and tell people, you got to stop doing that. Don't say that. You got to behave this way. What we become is behavior modifiers, not heart changers. I've met a lot of people in the tundra of Minnesota that have found Jesus where, man, they, on the outside, it doesn't seem like many, many things have changed over the years. But on the inside, you know they're totally different. That they love people better than I love people. But on the outside, I know how to play the game. I've built the filters on how to say the right things when I'm around the right people. Praise Jesus. He's good all the time. And he is. He's Jesus. But you just say that because that's a filter you put on when you're at church. And you walk out those back doors and you're something completely different. You know, most things are caught, not taught. Father of eight, my kids love the one wheel. Like I've got inspired, like our kids' names are Legend, Epic, and I have to use my fingers, I'm sorry, because there's so many of them. Uh, if I don't do that, I get up to eight and I'll forget someone and they'll watch online or they'll go, Dad, you didn't say my name? And, and I, there's no apology. It's like, you're right, I didn't. It's not that you're less important. I'm just, I just, I forgot. 
I have ADD, okay, forgive me. Okay, anyways, so you got legend, epic, icon, historic, inspire, greatness, courage, and revolution. Those are our eight children. Those are nick not nicknames. Those are the real names. And the whole, somebody asked me, why do you name them? It's like, that's awful. Why would you do that to your children? Because we're casting vision into our children's lives. We want them to be iconic. We want them to be legendary. We want them to make life epic. And we, listen, those names are earned, not given. Meaning, or not, 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 I don't label, you wouldn't label yourself as a legend. I'm a legend. No, legends are labeled legends because the way they live their life. So I want legend, my oldest son, to live his life with purpose and intentionality to serve other people that he might be one day able to earn his name. An epic, that he would live life in such an epic journey chasing Jesus and the stories that we read in the, the Jewish scriptures, uh, the Old Testament of the Bible, that the stories that epic would be a part of in this generation would be like the David and Goliath stories, these epic journeys of chasing Jesus and he would do epic things. That icon would be iconic for people. She's my, she's my oldest daughter. That she would live iconically, if that's even a word. I made it up maybe. Kathy French will tell me if I did. She's really good at that. She, she tells me when I don't say it right. I'm like, Jesus covers a multitude of sins, Kathy. It's good. Where, where, is, Miss, where is Kathy? Where are you? She's right there. I love you, Kathy. I do. She's been to my house so many times. Um, she rode the one wheel. Like, I, I, seriously, uh, you should follow uh, on Instagram and our YouTube channel. And she's on our YouTube channel riding a one wheel. She's, she's awesome. Um, she's like 16 years old riding a one wheel. I, I don't know how old she is actually. I've never asked, have I, Kathy? Young at heart, young in body. Yeah, she's over there. She's like, I didn't know you were going to put me on the spotlight. I didn't do that to her in the first service, only this one. You never know what I'll say, Kathy. Um, okay, so she rode the one wheel. I'm not sure how we got there, but Kathy's awesome. She came, but um, uh, Icon, uh, oh, uh, iconically. Uh, I, I want Icon to live in a way that she would be an example of how a young woman should behave in this generation, how to be a young godly woman. So we name them those names not to hurt them or make them feel embarrassed, but because I want to live intentional. If I'm going to be a guy that falls in love with Jesus and be a follower of Jesus, I better do being a follower of Jesus intentionally. If I'm going to be on mission to point people to Jesus for my entire life, I better do that intentionally. It doesn't come naturally. Naturally, we're selfish people. We don't want to tell people about Jesus because what if I get put on the spot? What if they ask me a question I don't know? Man, I went to school. I got the title pastor. People ask me questions still about God that I do not know. And I kind of think that's a qualification of making him God, that we don't know all things. And sometimes I get stumped. I go, I got to go do studying on that. I'll get back to you. He's God. So therefore, he shouldn't just be able to be explained all the time. That's what makes him so big. But, and we're not called to know everything. We're just simply to point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. He'll change people from the inside out. So, so easy to say, very difficult to do. If you're brand new around here and you're like, oh, okay, you're great. Uh, I'm tracking with what you're saying, kind of, but what, what it, keep talking about follower of Jesus. Follower of Jesus starts with the belief that Jesus is who he said he is. That's where it begins. Now, some of people, like especially in, in our culture in Minnesota, we, we started the church with zero people four years ago. We moved from Miami to Minneapolis. We got there. I remember my first prayer going, Jesus, I don't really think this through. We don't know anybody here, and churches require people. Um, what, how, do, how, how, do you, how do you see this playing out here? I was really nervous. I was like, what is going on? We just left the 25th largest church in the United States, and now I'm in the tundra. It's like, okay, people are required, and, and i just like, how, how do we? I, I, what? So we just, we're going to build a church for where unchurched people want to go. That was what we kept saying. We want people that don't know Jesus to step in our doors and come back the next week. Boy, that's a tricky deal because when unchurched people come, we're not shy about who Jesus is and how Jesus points out and says, hey, we're all sinners. Sinning is missing the mark, right? That's like, that's kind of a rough deal if you're a first time guest coming in and you're already hopeless and all of a sudden somebody says, well, listen, you're kind of messy. You need Jesus. It's like, like well, it, it can kind of be put off. So you got to figure out how to do this, right? How do you present Jesus in the way Jesus is meant to be presented? Where it's loving and kind, not judgmental. 
And so we, we began by uh, inviting some people that didn't know Jesus. We're like, hey, you, you, would you like to help us start a church? And I remember it, the first guy we talked to, his name's John. John goes, sure, I'll help you start a church. I've never gone to church. <laughs> Why would you want me? But I'll help. I mean, I can move stuff around. I go, well, I just figure if you help us create a church, we're going to create a church where more people that think like you are going to want to come to church. You're not going to help me take, like, change. We're not changing a message here. We're just figuring out how do we do this? How does this fit for this generation? And so John jumps in, and I, I love the idea of how that just feels like a Jesus thing. And here's why. We're going to jump into the author, Matthew, who is an eyewitness count of, of Jesus' things in the New Testament. So here's some, some proof, if you need it, if you're on the fence about being a follower of Jesus. Here's eyewitness accounts of people that documented who Jesus is. I'm going to say something that if you miss it, you're going to think I'm saying something that's not truth. Okay, so dial in. I read this recently that if you say the word sex from the stage, that for the another 18 seconds you have the audience. So I have 16 seconds for you to ga- engage. Uh, that, that, listen, I, we used to teach kids, and there's no problem with this song, that Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. That worked for a generation. And you're that generation. But really think about it for a second. That's not the truth. It is, but it's an event that happened that I know Jesus loves me so. That he died on a cross and rose again. And eyewitness accounts recorded it happening and it got put in the Bible. I read my Bible every day. I love my Bible. I have a ginormous, I mean, it's like takes a crane to put it on the table in the morning Bible. I open it up, it's highlighted. My kids see me read it every morning. So I'm not saying don't read your Bible. I'm not saying it's not God inspired. It is 100% true, God inspired. Everything you know about the Bible is true. But I know Jesus loves me because he died, rose again. It's the event. It's the event. That's why we should be excited about telling people about Jesus. Why do I know that Jesus is who he said he is? Because he died on a cross and rose again. That's it. That's the gospel. That's what we're telling people. Jesus died, rose again. How do I know that? Because eyewitness accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, said these things. They recorded it. It's just like me telling you the stories of my eight children. I'm eyewitness accounts of what's happening in Minnesota, and you're believing me? Why are we not believing, and not we as maybe some of you in here, but why are we in a generation right now that don't believe the eyewitness accounts? Because we just, we aren't teaching it that it's eyewitness accounts, that these people, these men saw Jesus die on a cross. They saw him get put in a tomb and then arise again. They saw it and wrote it down. That's pretty convincing stuff. That should really make Jesus really alive to people. Like, whoa, that's mind blowing. That's hard to argue. And then people want to argue, well, let's make fact check these books of the Bible and the authors. We can do that. There's so much proof that the Bible is and the authors are who they said they are. You know what? I was a youth pastor for 17 years, and I realized early on in student ministry that we were setting our kids up for failure. We were teaching them, oh, because the Bible says so, Bible says so, the Bible said so. They got to college their freshman year, and they had to write a paper, and these, uh, these freshman uh, college students are writing papers, and they're with something about viewpoints of life and ethics, and they're citing the Bible, and the professor comes in and says, you can't use the Bible. It's not, it can't, there's no bibliography that can be wrote for the Bible, and they start just de- de- dis- disassembling what they built their faith on, that it's the Bible. And it broke my heart because all of a sudden these kids are coming in. Well, look, my professor's saying it's not a real book because we can't write bibliographies on it and stuff. And that broke my heart. And I realized, oh, if we just switch it and go, it's a vent of Jesus and let's quote authors. So Matthew is an author of the Bible. You know what? The book of Matthew, you can write a bibliography for because you have the author. When you call it the, bi- the, the Bible as whole, well, the professor's like, yeah, but it's God inspired. He's the, you can't, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to quote author Matthew then. And he wrote a book called Matthew. And here's the date he wrote it in. Here's his author. And this is where I'm pulling it from. And all of a sudden, they can now stand on 
the event that Jesus died on a cross and rose again and their professor just is dumbfounded. Like, how do I fight that? Do you know that there are people that they, they go to be profession or professors just to be able to get young followers of Jesus in there just to discredit who Jesus is? We as a church have got to prepare the next generation to stand those debates. We've got to prepare them. We've got to build the church to hand off. This is not your church. This is the next generation's church. What are you doing with it? What are you going to hand off to them? You're going to hand off something amazing and something that you are proud of and something you said, we gave it all we had. It's a packed house. So many people's lives are being changed. Take it. Are you going to hand off a church that is just like, well, here's what's left? Some of you are like, whoa, you're stepping on some toe. No. And this isn't, a, this isn't a pastor thing. This is, this is a all skate, all play church thing. You are the people of the church. You are the voice of the church. Somewhere you've got okay with like, I don't need to bring my neighbors. I don't have to love my neighbor actually. I don't even have to talk to my neighbor. Somehow you got that. You think that's okay. We somehow we got okay where we don't, just don't point people to Jesus anymore. We just are okay pointing out all the problems with no solutions. We, we're, we're okay with, oh, that, that area of Austin's really messed up. That's where that kind of person lives. And that, if you know where unchurched people live, why are you pointing at them and not going to them? That doesn't sound like a Jesus thing at all. Jesus didn't point and go, oh, that's where the sick people are. I got to go around them. Jesus said, that's where the sick people are. That's where I need to be. Are you a church where sick people want to be? Or are they sick of your church? I'm not trying to hurt you. Hear my heart. I have a passion for unchurched people. I have a passion for us. Anybody, I just do. I hope to light something underneath you that you're like, okay, these are Jesus things. <laughs> Let's go get them. The messy people Jesus did life with, look at Matthew, author of Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. This is an account where uh, Matthew is a tax collector. A lot of you already know this, but for those that don't, Matthew, tax collector in those days, just the bad guy. No one wanted to be around tax collectors for the fear of, he goes, man, I want a latte right now. Hey, you owe taxes. Why don't you buy my drink and then we'll call it even kind of deal. They just didn't like that. It was just a shady person. As long as the tax collector paid what was Caesar's, they could charge you whatever else they wanted for income. So really people wanted to be, the, the guys that were just trying to get, get away with things, they really wanted to become friends with Matthew so he wouldn't charge them as much. So Matthew's a guy no one wants to be around. The religious people really didn't like the tax collector. And here we jump into a story in chapter 9. Jesus was walking along and saw a man, Matthew, sitting at his tax collector booth. He is in the middle of his mess. Jesus sees him in his mess. He didn't go, oh yeah, the tax collectors are over there. He is sitting there. Jesus sees it. Jesus goes, I'm going to go there then. I'm going to go to the mess. And so he heads over to the mess and he says to him, he didn't go, hey, you're a messy guy. You're really jacked up. You need to clean up yourself and then come talk to me. These are Jesus' words. Follow me and be my disciple. There was no stop watching those movies don't, don't do that. Start doing this. Stop that. You can't go there. Change your friends. This is, Jesus is, hey, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew got up and followed him. That sounds really easy. Yet we make it so difficult in Western culture, er, churches where it's so hard to be a follower of Jesus because it's like you got to completely change everything instantaneously. We don't see that here. We see Matthew change his life as he gets closer to Jesus. It starts with the belief that Jesus is who he said he is, then actions follow, then results. But we reverse it in Western culture, Christianity, actions first, that will lead to belief, that will give results. Think about that for a second. Any of you, don't show your hands, but any of you ever tried to do a diet? You're just like, I need to lose weight. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop eating carbs. Uh, I, I'm an endurance athlete, so I eat carbs all the time. Like, more carbs, please. And so when somebody tells me I've cut out carbs, I'm like, how do you live? No wonder why you're miserable. You just cut out something. Just eat less. Eat less. Just back away from the table. Okay, you didn't know you are going to get diet strategy either. But okay, so 
Think about this, the diet plan. Okay, I'm just going to pick up a diet. It's going to make me uh, thinner or feel healthier. And then what happens after a couple weeks? You stop doing it. You just thought the action would give the results. It, it's the belief will keep you doing the action, which will give you the results. We want people to believe who Jesus is because that will make them a lifelong follower of Jesus where they hear Jesus' words and they will do something about them. We don't want people to be followers of Jesus based on your opinion. We want them to hear Jesus and do something about it. A Jesus follower is this. I hear what Jesus is saying and I do something about it. I hear Jesus, I do something. That's why I asked you, what is Jesus saying to you today and what are you going to do about it? If you keep coming to church every Sunday and you just walk out going, oh, I didn't like the music and that guy had long hair, I'm not really into that. He wrote a one wheel, what was that about? Uh, I wish they would do that and this. You, you missed it. That's not what the church is about. The church is on mission to change the world, to point people to Jesus. When we get it turned in, circling the wagons, going, I don't like this, I don't like that, we need more of that, if we only, and we did that. That's not your job. It's Jesus' church. Jesus changes people. You to be on mission. Your priority is how am I on mission at my job, at mission with my family? How am I doing life on mission with intentionality? Jesus says to Matthew and all those guys, right? Become my disciples. And some of them, he says, I'm going to make you fisher of men. We live in Minnesota. It's the land of 10,000 lakes. There's also a saying about Minnesota. It's Minnesota nice. If you've been on a missions trip up there, you've seen it. It's a thing, Minnesota nice. I'll explain to you what Minnesota nice is. We tell you that it's the land of 10,000 lakes, but really there's close to 13,000 lakes there. We don't want you to feel really bad about only have a couple lakes in Texas, so we say 10,000 lakes. That's Minnesota nice, okay? We, it's just, that is, it's a thing. There's lakes everywhere. I love the fish, and we are, we are privileged to have a lake in our backyard and once a week I go catch dinner you know there's nothing greater to come home and tell your wife I provided dinner like I, I went and caught it I cleaned it we're eating it's like you just feel like a man you're like whoo I did this this is so good here you are a woman be proud of your man you know what I mean? it's like whoo yeah now there are some days I come home and go I got nothing for you babe and she's like what now I have to think about dinner. I know I failed you. <laughs> no, it's no good. But when I do go fishing, there's a certain fish I love to catch, and it's called a walleye. They are delicious. Best fish in fresh water. If you've never had one, come up. I'll, I'll take you. They're a hard fish to catch, but so worth it. When I go walleye fishing, there's a certain way to ca catch walleye. So when I go, I go where the walleye are in the lake, and I use the right bait. I don't attach the kitchen sink to the end of my line and drag that around the lake hoping a walleye bites the kitchen sink. That would just be ludicrous. But we do that all the time when we go and think about being fisher of men as a church. We, we do things that we like that they don't like. What if we started thinking about what would actually communicate to the unchurched that we love them? What if we played music that they like? What if we created a place that they love? Jesus is using an analogy so we understand it. We are to think intention that how are we, you, like, I know it sounds like bait, like, oh boy, that sounds so, but it's really like, what are we doing to make it attractive to be a follower of Jesus? Some of you do life and I don't, if, if, if the Jesus you're portraying is the Jesus you're telling, I don't think people want to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus is not like frowny guy, grumpy person. It's like the hope of the world. It's like, come on. Let's seize the moment. And yeah, I love the second part of this story where, where Matthew then invites Jesus to, and his disciples to come home to a dinner with other tax collectors. Jesus does such a great job here of loving Matthew and didn't point out Matthew's shortcomings that Matthew feels so loved by Jesus. He's like, why don't you come hang out with the rest of us? You're not going to embarrass me. You're not going to come over here and crack us all in the head with some big Bible telling us we just didn't get it right. You're going to love us for where we are. This is amazing. Jesus, come on. You got to tell this to other people because the way Jesus presented the, himself to him, it was all love. No judgment. If we're doing it right, people are going to want to bring more people around you because people are going to like, man, maybe this Jesus thing on you will rub off on them. And so Jesus, Jesus goes to the dinner which is awesome. Let me ask this question. 
If you are genuinely a Jesus follower and you're thinking I'm doing a life on mission, when was the last time you had somebody that didn't know Jesus at your dinner table? Actually, who was the last person you had at a dinner table that you invited that was not family? Somewhere in Western culture, we just think we just do our life all by ourselves. We've got our work friends, so we do work there. Church people I see on Sunday. What? No, it's about doing life with each other. Not doing life alone. If you're a quilter, don't quilt by yourself. Quilt with other people. If you paint, paint with somebody else. Get on mission. You should be doing at least one meal a night or a week, sorry, one meal a week with people at your a table. Doing life with people. We are convinced that, oh no, I got soccer to get to, football to get to, I got to get golf in, I got to fish in, I get, I'm just too busy to do that. Then you're too busy. Stop it. Being too busy is a problem. The devil's convinced us that that's productivity and that means you're successful. The devil's really good at what he does. Stop being too busy to do life with people. If you're just bouncing from one event to the next event, you can't sit down and have lunch with your family and somebody else. There is a problem with that. Stop. Have time to do life with people. Because, listen, Jesus made time for the tax collectors that night. He's like, sure. He probably had other plans. Sure, we'll come. They hang out. And then verse 11, but the Pharisees saw this, the religious people, and asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Why is he hanging around with the dirty people? And I love what transpires there. You should go home and read it yourself. Really, if you're not reading your Bible, you should read it every day. It's a really good, it's a really good read. It'll change your life forever. But that is a great snapshot of what we should be doing daily. That we should be inspiring other people to do. So maybe your homework this week is to start doing dinner with somebody around your table. Did you know, I read this the other day, that the most intimate piece of furniture in your household is the table. Because it's the only place where you are eye to eye with people. That you're talking. Think about it. When you eat dinner and then you move it to another room and maybe you're going to serve dessert there or something, no longer is the eye connection the center of the thing, the people across the table. It becomes a TV, becomes a fireplace, becomes the center of the deal. But the table, that's where life happens. Remember I talked about using the right bait being intentional, being a life on mission. We started a YouTube channel two years ago because we were like, okay, Jesus has called us to be after the unchurched. YouTube, let's start a YouTube channel and really uh, uh, try to reach people through YouTube. It's a genuine heart of ours to use YouTube and reach people. So if you'd like to follow our YouTube channel, it's just my name, Scott Mendenhall. We do a lot of videos about one wheels and boosted boards. And then we sneak in there every once in a while while we're always so happy. Because people aren't going to search and want to follow us if they're on church people where I'm just preaching at them all the time. They are not going to, that's not just, they're not into that. But they want to learn about one wheels that you can get on our YouTube channel and learn about them. If you want to learn about uh, fishing, sometimes we put stuff up there on fishing. We're just trying to gain an audience to point people to Jesus. Using the right bait, getting the right people. There's five, there's over five billion videos uploaded daily on YouTube. There are over like, I mean, it's just like billions of, like five billion think about videos are put up there. There's like, I don't know the number, but it's, it's just, it might even be trillions of views a day on YouTube. And there's a lot of junk on YouTube. But we're getting in the fight. What happens though, think about this one, the long play, this sounds like a Jesus thing to me. What if Jesus uses YouTube if we can continue to generate enough subscribers and viewers then we could build a church one day with YouTube money. You want to happen with us? A church plant. We, we are not self-sufficient. We still have partnering churches that help us uh, be able to do what we do every day. There are people that give every month. And some of you are sitting in this room. Thank you so much. You are helping us spread the gospel there. But we did a party for Memorial Day. And we, we smoked some meat. And it was like $344 and some odd change. That month, we got a check from YouTube that covered the party. If that YouTube check didn't come in as a church planner, I was paying for it. That's just how we roll around up there. All of a sudden I'm like, what? People are watching our stuff. We're getting paid by YouTube to spread the gospel. This is amazing. This sounds like Jesus. So if you'd like to spread the gospel, just subscribe to our channel and, and, and watch our videos, share it with people. Uh, and while you're on your device doing that, you should subscribe to your Twitter accounts for your church. 
or your Instagram. There's like a couple thousand of you that come to this church. You have 200 people that are subscribed to your Instagram. And I was watching the other, I'm one of the 200 and I live in Minnesota. Someone posted a picture about this baptism. Uh, that, is it coming up? I can't, is it, have, you guys had a baptism service recently or is it ha- had? Okay, so they posted, it was at the quarries 40 years ago. They had a picture 40 years ago of baptisms happening out at the quarries, which was awesome. It was like, they didn't even have to add a filter because it was just old, right? And so they posted, it was so amazing. And then they had one of your pastor baptizing recently and he was in these waders. And it took me a second, I was like, what is he wearing? And then I caught on there like, waders. In Minnesota, we wear those to go dunk hunting and put our docks in. And I was like, well, the last time we baptized in water, it was like so cold. I was shivering. My lips were I was like, no, we baptized in the name of... And I was like, waders are so genius. Like, I'm taking that from him. I was like, he's, that's why he's a doctor right there. Because gosh, he's a genius. <laughs> why didn't I think of that before? But I'm watching the story be told of a 125-year-old church, which are you not celebrating that tonight? Yeah? Watermelon? And what, just watermelon? Is it just a watermelon thing? Watermelon ice cream? I've never done that before. I'll put it on the list. However, Kathy tried to get me to do ice cream and grapes last night. It's a thing, right, Kathy? She says it's amazing. Try that too. Um, that's when in Texas, do Texan things. Um, in, anyways, you guys, 125 years old, do you know that's, a, that's our goal as a church? We're four years old. This fall will be four. You're 125 years old. You know you're here today because of a generation behind you let go of the baton. It's your turn to let go of the baton and give it to the next generation. Ever watch the Olympics? One of my favorite events in the Olympics is the relay race. And you never know that the baton is being passed around ever until there's a problem. Somebody fumbles the baton. Somebody holds on to it too long or they throw it at them instead of handing it off. There are heaps of churches in this world today that are struggling with the handoff and they're closing their doors. And it's not a money problem. They, they're, they're, there was a church in the Twin Cities that just closed their doors. They're close to 100 years old. They had heaps of money in the bank, but they didn't have people. They didn't hand it off. We're building Unlocked Church in, to hand it off. It's not our church. We want our, floor, or our ceiling to be the next generation's floor. We're going to go hard as fast and long as we can. But we're going to reach as far as we can so that when we hand it off to the next generation, we're like, hey, we did our best. We're handing you off at its peak. Here you go. Run with it. Do great things. I'm going to read two stories that are just, this is, the, this is it. This is Jesus' stories. Young guys that are in our church that have come in because they have found one wheels on our YouTube channel and they stuck and found Jesus in our church. Other people, uh, this young man named Ryan, he heard that we had one wheels and asked if he could ride one. I said, sure, come to church and we'll ride him afterwards. So he shows up one Sunday to ride one wheels. I got him to come to church, so I felt like I won already. And Ryan comes in, he rides the one wheel. We do these things after church at my house. We call them the after party. Just using lingo that unchurched people would know. It's just, hey, come hang out my house so I can just teach Jesus stuff more to you. So we do this after party. We've got about 35 young adults that come hang out at my house with my eight kids and three dogs and a cat. And our house is really itty bitty. Our whole house would fit in the lower section. It's a small house. But we just, we just do it. I and mean, we're just doing life. And uh, Ryan came over, rode the one wheel, loved it. This was three weeks ago. And then the, last week he re- gives me this text. Hey, Scott, this is Ryan. He's about 25 years old. I I was just messing with you because I had something to say Sunday, but for some reason found myself way too insecure to find my voice. I don't really keep it a secret, but I'm not a follower of Jesus for reasons too long to explain in text. And maybe one day we'll talk about it. Having said that, I like the group. He's talking about, I, I like Unlocked Church a lot. And I've felt very happy since I have come on board. This happiness is making me want to open my mind and heart to the idea of who Jesus is. Though I don't think it will be easy for me, I hope you aren't dissuaded by me not being a follower of Jesus. And maybe one day we'll talk about questions. I hope Sunday is great, and I'll see you when I get back from Washington. That was three weeks after coming to Unlock Church. Totally anti-God. I get that text about 10 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. I see it, and I call him immediately like, Ryan, 
Scott here, man. Got your text. I'll, you can ask those questions right now. Let's talk it out. And we talked for a couple of hours. He thanked me. He, he, was, he couldn't believe that I would call him. I short, shared that story the next day to some of those around us. And some of them were like, Scott, like you should have been off the clock at that point. You're, you know, don't feel like you got to do that stuff. And I looked right at him and I said, you think that's a pastor thing? That's a follower of Jesus thing. That's an everybody do it kind of thing. If, G if those moments come to you at 10 o'clock at night, 1 a.m., you pick up that phone and call because that's Jesus thing. Jesus just put it on a tee. He said, hey, hit the ball. I'm going to blow the ball out of the park. You just need to tap the thing. I'll do the rest. Just tap it. Just make the stinking phone call, Scott. It wasn't a pastor problem. It was a Jesus thing. Call him. I, I, Ryan still comes. He can't believe that we aren't pushing him to be a follower of Jesus. We don't shy away. We pray for our meals still. We still give credit to Jesus. You know what? This week, he bought a one wheel. He bought a new one. He rode 26 miles from where he lives to my house on a one wheel. For those that have been there, you've flown into the airport and you've been to my house. He lives by our airport and he rode a one wheel from the airport to my house. Why? Because he knew we were doing camp last week and he heard that 100, almost 100 kids found Jesus in the park and he said, I had to come hear the story. Yeah, I just said that to people that said they're followers of Jesus and I heard an amen, thank you, but no claps, no hooting and hollering. I think we're missing it, people. That a guy that's on, you know why we miss it? Because we forgot. We have forgotten what it's like to be hopeless. Ryan, in the journey of it, he rode 26 miles to hear the stories of what Jesus did in a park last week in a summer camp for kids he didn't know. Because he's experiencing Jesus and it's real to him. You better get back to the place where you remember what it's like to be lost and what it was like to find Jesus because you'll clap when anybody ever says anything about somebody finding Jesus because that's a miracle. Someone lost is found. Someone dead is alive. Guys, that doesn't just happen. And I'm not trying to get up in your face, and, but man, it breaks my heart. What is worth celebrating more than that? Last story, Derek, 24 years old. Derek, and I'm going to wrap this up. Derek trying to tell the story right because John first guy we invited to church John took a year and like two months before he became a follower of Jesus for the first year of Unlocked Church he ran our sound and set up with us every day was never a follower of Jesus there was plenty of times he called and said hey I can't be there I'm hungover all right man drink a lot of water it speeds up the hangover just we'll see you next week we didn't get on him. We didn't yell at him and say, That's, you're a bad man for doing that. I was like, all right, man, because we knew it's Jesus' job to change. We'll keep praying for him. When we have the opportunity to speak in those things, we will. He finds Jesus. His life changed drastically. He invites his sister, who is the girlfriend to Derek. Now, we're about to say, Emily and Derek are not married. They come in with two kids. We let them volunteer. Emily volunteered pretty quick. With Derek not being a follower of Jesus and they're not married, we're like, hey, great, we'd love to have you volunteer. We say, use tasks to do ministry, not ministry to do tasks. We should welcome people in our church with people that don't know Jesus because when they see somebody that don't know Jesus, they'll know what they look like and they'll have something in common. And so Derek writes this on Facebook the other day. This is good. A year ago, if you told me I'd be at a worship conference at a church, I would have called you a liar without a doubt. Faith has always been something what a, of a wrestle for me. And I don't see that ever completely going away. Logically, my brain forces me to doubt things that we just don't have proof of. And for many years, I have been very cynical about religion. That being said, my life has drastically changed over the last year. And the biggest change has been Emily and I started bringing our church to Unlock Church in Maple Grove. That's the city we are, a suburb of the Twin Cities. I don't know if I'm ready to admit to myself that Jesus is the cause for all of the good that has come into my life, but I do know that my heart is more full since the start of this journey than at the other points in my life. I feel like I will always struggle to some degree, but this level of peace in my life is not something I will take for granted. Yeah, come on. Those are Jesus stories. Derek took Friday off because he heard what was happening in the park. 
He heard what Jesus was doing. Derek had to come see it for himself because it's modern day Jesus stories. He's going to be an eyewitness account. When he fully commits to Jesus, he's going to say, I saw Jesus move in the park. We are a church plant. We rent everything. We had to rent a park, a big tent. And we just said, Jesus, we're going to work as if it depends on us, but we're praying that you bring people. Over 400 kids came in, into the park. Rain or shine, we did tr- camp out there. It was so much fun. We loved it. Uh, we, we got to see so many great, great, and I could just keep going on Jesus stories. But everything you've heard today, are eyewitness accounts of modern day Jesus stories. I could give you things where, and last week we had this idea, we needed foam pit cubes. It was like a couple hundred dollars. We're a church. I didn't have a couple hundred dollars. And so I was like, God, what do we do? And he said, look local. Like he didn't text me that. He just said, look local for foam pit cubes. I got into the office. I said, guys, we need to contact somebody local for foam pit cubes. They looked at me like, uh, why would we do that? Just do it. We find a distributor in Fridley, Minnesota, that where we keep our church trailer throughout the week. We call them up. We're saying, hey, we need pink and black foam pit cubes. Do you have any? What is this for? They asked. We said, it's for a free summer camp in Maple Grove, Minnesota. We'll come get them from you if you have them. He said, hold on. He pulls the phone away. You can hear him saying, hey, go, boss, there's this kids camp happening. It's called Unlock Summer Camp. Can we give free foam pit cubes to these guys? They need 200 of them. Yeah, that's awesome. We'd love to help a community event. He gets going, hey, we got foam pit cubes for you. Awesome. We'll be right over there. He says, they're not pink and black. They're orange and green. Are you okay with that? We're like, that's great. We don't care about their color. We'll be right over there. Those are Jesus stories that are happening constantly in the tundra of Minnesota because we are intentionally living our life depending on Jesus to show up and show off in my life. And then we keep pointing people to Jesus as he does it. May you be inspired today to live life differently. May you go out of here today, as Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. He said, go, meaning on your way to lunch today, point somebody to Jesus. He doesn't mean get yourself to Africa. Some might be called to do that. Some of you might be called to get to the tundra of Minnesota, do that. But he's saying on your way to lunch, point somebody to Jesus today. And if you don't do that on the way to, you're missing what Jesus said to you. That means you're in disobedience. Stop doing that. Be obedient followers of Jesus. Point people to him. You'll have Jesus stories as well. And the last thing you probably should do is get your kids signed up for Austin, uh, Austin summer camp that you guys have here in a couple of weeks. I think it's Austin, you know, campaustin.org. Go to that and sign up. I'm coming to it. I'm coming from the Minnesota to be there to that camp. You better be there. Get your neighbors signed up. Sign stranger kids up. It's free. It's the gospel being presented for free. If you're looking for a baby step, sign up and volunteer. There's going to be unchurched people there. Get yourself there. Sign the kids at the grocery store today. I'm signing you up right now. Go to campaustin.org. Sign up now. What are you waiting for? Your church is presenting something to reach out to the city. Go do it. It's a genius title. Think about it. It's Camp Austin. Somebody that's going to be turned off by the church is not going to be turned off by Camp Austin. Doesn't it, it sounds like a Jesus thing. We're about Austin. We're not about our church. We're about the big things, the city. We want to see the city turn to Jesus. CampAustin.org. Get there. Sign up. Volunteer. If you don't, shame on you. That said, let me pray for you. <laughs> let me pray for you. I hope you're fired up today. I hope you are. I hope to get a report that Jesus broke out and showed up in Austin, Texas. And I, I, I mean, I'll come back down here and get a scoop of what Jesus is doing and take it back to Minnesota. Come on now. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Today, I hope he spoke to you. I hope your heart's racing, your stomach's turning, that you're like, I need to get on mission. I need to be on mission. Get on mission. Come on. Let's point people to Jesus. I know some of you came in and you're like, yeah, that's great, but I came in hurting and I don't have hope. Here's the deal. You do now. It's Jesus. And Jesus said, believe. Ask yourself, do you believe the eyewitness accounts that he died on a cross and rose again? It starts right there. And there's heaps of great people in this church that will help you figure out the next steps from there. They will. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. I hope you sense my passion for the unchurched and I hope that you do not take it as me coming at you or coming down on you. That's not my intentions. My intentions is to, like a locker room pep talk. The game's about to start when you get dismissed. Get after it. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank for these amazing people sitting here and put up with me going late and keeping them from lunch. 
May you give us uh, food and water that we will never thirst again or be hungry again. That Jesus, you would put us on mission. That Austin would be forever changed. That the devil would be frightened today because of High Park today and how motivated we are now to get after it. That was awesome. I am so excited for you guys to hear a little bit of a previous teaching talking about Camp Austin, which ended up taking place where Scott Joey and myself flew out there to put on Unlock Summer Camp, Unlock Church's version of camp in Austin, Texas. And there's more to come in our partnership with this church. And Scott, it was just yeah, so fun to was, be able to kind of revisit what that, that summer looked like yeah, when you it, were there. It's so much fun to go back in time and history and see what God was up to and doing and how God's word never uh, returns void, no matter what season it is. And so hopefully you got something out of that. I do love the idea of camp and us being able to take what we do here in Minnesota and send it to the four corners of the earth. We've done camp in Puerto Rico. We've done camp in South Florida. We've done it in Texas. And I think there's more to come about camp, which we're going to get to some of our upcoming events here in a second. But we're going to give everyone a chance to continue to partner with us, your resources, and give your tithes and offerings to Unlock Church. It's super, super easy. Get out your smartphone. You can text the number 77977, the word unlock in the subject. Hit send. It'll bounce back to you saying click this link and you can set up those things to be able to give. Your resources help us do these things like camp, help us do things online. All the things you're experiencing is because of your faithfulness in trusting God with your resources. Obviously, Unlock Church uses it to continue to do the Great Commission, which is making disciples, going in all the world and making disciples. And so we're really excited about camp. Lil, what do we got for camps this year? Yes, we have a lot planned, as you could tell from that teaching and just kind of what we've been transitioning to speak on. We love Unlock Summer Camp. We love the Challenge Camp. We love the camps we get to do for the next generation. First up, we have Unlock Summer Camp happening this June. Signups are now live. So you can go to unlockchurch.com slash unlock summer camp, or there's a tab on Unlock, Sum unlock Church's website, and you can get your kids signed up. Also, if you are free those dates, June 24th through 28th, and you want to drive to Minnesota, you want to fly to Minnesota, yeah. we invite you to do that. You are invited to come and volunteer. Bring your kids. Maybe you have kids that aren't age 4 through 12. They can volunteer with you, and this is a way for you to get involved in what your church is doing. So we invite you to do that, and then if you can't make it, we want you to just commit to praying every single day for the kids that are going to be attending Unlock Summer Camp. Pray for the teams who are coming up. Pray for the people who are coming up. Pray for us that yep. we that we might be able to reach tons of kids for the sake of the gospel. So commit to praying those dates. We also have the Challenge Camp. Yeah, which is for high school, middle school, and it is so much fun. All in all or nothing. Uh, it's going to be an amazing camp. It's a leadership camp where we challenge young people to get comfortable in the uncomfortable, challenge the high school middle schoolers to lead versus follow. It's a camp that pushes and pulls them out of their comfort zone. It is a lot of fun. It does cost because it is a different style of camp than the kids camp. So the cost is, uh, I believe it's 150 is that 175. right? 175. Yep. Uh, 175. It, bring your teenagers in, uh, all those things. If you're like, hey, I want to come volunteer, I want to come bring a teenager, email Lily or me at the church and we can help get you a host home and all those things. We can right. sort that out, okay? If you would like to say, I can't come, but I want to scholarship somebody, I want to pay for somebody, you can do that as yep. well by giving at that number that we said before. Or you can go to unlockchurch.com slash give and you can pay for some people to go to camp. We also have mission trips happening. This is happening in May. May, right after Mother's Day, Monday after that, the 13th through the 20th. We're going where, Lil? We are going to Arkansas. We are partnering with Passion Play and Dirt Surfers, which is another one-wheel race. And the Great Passion Play is a Christian organization that puts on a production of the life of Jesus and the story of Jesus and thousands of people will see it within the next year. So we get to partner with them and making their grounds ready for that upcoming season. So if that excites you, we're going on mission as a group. And this is just a really great time for us to serve and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so if that excites you, why don't you sign up for that? If you're not coming locally from Minnesota, we can get you plugged in to get a flight or drive in and um, pay for lodging and food as well. So we'd love to have you join if this is something that you saw us do 
last year but weren't able to go and you know that you wanted to this year, now's the time to make that decision and commitment whether or not you have the finances for it. When we got a lot happening around here, uh, again, there's so many opportunities for you guys to jump in at any level you want. And so I know we just spent a great deal of time talking about things we're doing around here, but we are a church trying to make an impact in the world. And thank you for being with us. Thanks for hanging with us today here at Unlock Church. We did miss Dwayne. We missed Joey. But when we pre-recorded this throughout the week, they were not available. And so they will be back next week as we are in a series about difficult people. It is a fun series. Hopefully you enjoyed the first week last week. Week. It's a really simple guide to dealing with needy, manipulative, hypocritical, and overly critical people that drive you crazy yeah. every day. Besides all the spiritual takeaways from last week, I my my quote was, "I'm needy, but I can fill my own needs." Ooh, dang, <laughs> that's, that's difficult, a good... but it's difficult. Yeah, but that's it a... just reveals how difficult I really am. That's a good <laughs> that's a good tagline as well. So yeah. we'll be back next week talking about difficult people. Episode two or t- part two or however we're going to say it. We'll talk yeah. about that next week. So everybody, thanks for being with us. Lil, thanks for helping pre-record. Yeah. Uh, Super I, fun to be here. I'm hopping in the vehicle right now to head to Austin. It's crazy that this is like present for you, but this is... Past for us. Past for us, yeah. everybody. All right, everybody. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next Sunday. Adios. Bye.